Did pirates ever use galleons? Short answer, no. So you tell me that Francis Drake used a galleon. He did, though he wasn't a pirate but a naval officer, and he wasn't active during the golden age of sea roving, lasting from 1630 to 1730, and the period that I exclusively cover on this channel. The rovers of this period had a society and culture that was unique from what came before or after, and they shouldn't really be compared to rovers from other periods. But galleons must have been used by golden age pirates at some point. It was a popular ship in the period, wasn't it? To answer that, we need to discuss what a galleon actually is. Truthfully, there isn't a solid definition of a galleon. Nowadays we like to categorize ships into clearly defined classes, but this was not the case during the age of sail. The definitions of a vessel often varied. In Europe, for example, a sloop was an auxiliary vessel with different riggings. It could have two masts, one mast, even three masts. But in the Americas, a sloop was a one-masted sailboat exclusively. The definition of a ship type evolved as well. A bark during the 1600s was a large open boat, but in the late 1700s it was a full-rigged ship. This was the case of the galleon. The original galleons built and used during the 1500s were medieval vessels with raised forecastle and a high stern castle with prominent galleries. They had three or four masts and were used as both military and cargo ships. A variant of the galleon called the race-built galleon was even used by naval officers like Francis Drake. This distinct silhouette is what we imagine a galleon to look like, and what we see in video games like Sid Meier's Pirates, books like Captain Blood, and TV series like Black Sails. By 1650, this ship design had gone extinct. During the Age of Sail, the hull design of ships generally evolved as follows. The lines became straighter or cleaner, and the raised sections became lower until ships were built flush from stem to stern. Take for example this picture of a Karak, the first great ship in the Age of Sail. As you can see it has very high raised sections and is almost round in its shape. Compared to this ship of the line from the late Age of Sail, its sides are straight as arrows and its main deck is flat. Europeans documented their shipbuilding rather strictly, so we can safely say that the design we'd call a galleon went extinct around 1650. Maybe some individual galleons survived after that, but it's debatable. So what about the word galleon? Was it still used? An encyclopedia of geography from 1683 describes the term galleon as no longer in use, except by the Italians and especially by the Spanish, who reserved it for their ships trading from Spain to the New World, without regard to size or type of construction. Simply put, since the latter half of the 1600s, galleon was simply a word for Spanish treasure ship. The treasure ships were continually referred to as galleons or galeones until the early 1800s, when the treasure fleet system discontinued due to the collapse of the Spanish Empire. So what did these treasure fleet galleons look like? They weighed 400 tons or more and carried 50 to 60 cannon. They had higher sterns than frigates, and Woods Rogers saw one galleon in 1709 built with galleries. Due to their heavy top weight, the galleon had to carry a lot of cargo to ensure balance. They were also richly ornamented with gold and card works, but overall, the treasure galleons of the Golden Age were essentially as large ships of the line. But did pirates ever crew these treasure ships or galleons? No, they did not. These galleons were large, heavily armed and travelled in organized fleets under escort. Pirates during the Golden Age commanded light vessels that would have been torn to shreds and were simply unable to commandeer galleons. But even if they could, did they really want to? These galleons were large trade ships ferrying luxury goods across the Atlantic. They were cargo freighters. Pirates used nimble sailboats that could chase down lightly armed merchant ships. Their boat had to run against the wind and escape into shallow waters where larger vessels would run aground. A galleon could never do this and would require too much manpower, upkeep and skill to navigate. There are some stories about pirates capturing and commandeering treasure ships or galleons. The most famous would be the story of Pierre Legrand a Tortuga pirate who allegedly boarded and claimed a stray treasure galleon, with only a piragua. However, there exists little evidence to verify the facts of this presumed myth. It is believed to be based in reality, but it's more likely that Pierre captured one of the other large cargo vessels used by the Spaniards for local Caribbean trade. We'll get into those types in a bit. But first, I want to talk about the closest evidence we have of pirates commanding a galleon. La Sintisima Trinidad. This was a Spanish ship that originally escaped Henry Morgan's sack of Panama in 1671, and was later captured in 1680 by another group of buccaneers. The buccaneers commander decided to make La Santissima his flagship, and called her the Blessed Trinity. 
Alexander Excomalian refers to the Santissima as a galleon, but he probably never saw her himself. The pirates who actually captured and sailed her, like Bartholomew Sharp and Basil Ringrose, described her in their journals simply as a ship or a great ship. So calling her a galleon seems to be an error. They kept her because she was well built and an excellent sailor, not to carry out bombastic raids or sea battles. Because she didn't carry a single cannon. What did the Spanish use instead of galleons? So the galleon as we know was abandoned by 1650, but the term remained in use for the gargantuan treasure ships bringing goods to Europe. Gotcha. So what did the Spanish use instead for their everyday fighting and trading in the Caribbean? The most popular vessel in the Caribbean was the sloop, known as a balandra by the Spaniards. Bark is a rather mundane and catch-all term for a large variety of vessels used by the Spanish. Larger barks were generally single deck, had round sterns, one or two masts, and weighed between 10 to 100 tons. Small barks were typically undecked, essentially large rowboats, and they were very good with oars. Barks were used for trading, privateering, and pirate hunting, and pirates would often capture and use them from the Spanish. Piraguas were large, masted canoes used for small-scale trading. In 1674, Spanish governors were given the permission to grant letters of marque to Piragua commanders, giving birth to the dreaded Garda Costa. Pirate hunters who mostly acted as pirates themselves, and rarely left prisoners unharmed or even alive. The Guarda Costa likewise used half galleys, which were long, two masted boats with a large amount of oars, swivel guns, and a chaser cannon in the fore. Fragatas were frigate built ships with finer, swifter lines and galleons, and were merchant ships. They were used for pirate hunting and often served as flagships. One of these was the Santissima Trinidad de Nuestra Senora de Atocha, a 600 ton fragata built from Cedar in the New World. Spanish ships built in the New World were called Creole ships or now Creoya. The Atocha was richly decorated, carried around 60 guns, and even had a small shrine dedicated to San Diego tied around the mizzen mast. Her crew would turn out for grand mass on the main deck. Whilst we often associate the flute with the Netherlands, the design was used by all European nations. Also, unless if you're Dutch, please stop calling it a fluit. It's called a flute in English. Anyways, Spanish flutes were called urca and were the most common full rig merchantmen used by the Spanish in the Caribbean. The English used hulk in reference to Spanish urcas. What did an urca look like? It was immediately recognizable with its rounded front, round belly and broad beam. It had a shallow draft and a flat bottom, allowing it to travel up rivers and in shallow waters. Most had three masts, but I've heard of some having only one or two. The masts were sometimes short, allowing them to be used by a smaller crew. Another distinctive feature of the Urca were their tall and narrow sterns, giving them an almost galleonesque appearance. Truly, the Urca should be the stereotypical Spanish vessel, not the galleon. Most Urcas were navios de registro, or registry ships, vessels that were licensed to sail independently of the treasure fleet. Pirates sought greedily after a special Urca called the Honduras ship. Annually, it sailed from Spain to Honduras, exchanging European goods for local produce, and it was vital for the local economy. Pirates could easily predict the movements of the Honduras ship, having learned how long it took for it to load and unload its goods, its rough timetable, and by interrogating Spanish captives. The problem with taking on the Honduras ship were its defenses. It was a large ship heavily armed with cannon, and if boarded, the defenders could retreat to close quarters. Fortified positions within the ship, armed with loopholes and even cannons, these were essentially like bunkers. They would likewise set up traps like spiked boards and exploding jars or chests. The Manila Galleon was built in the fashion of treasure ships, but they travelled independently from the treasure fleet, usually in small numbers, often just alone, or an escort by a patash, either a tender or a frigate. The Manila Galleon was also called the Acapulco ship, since they travelled through the Pacific from Spain's Asiatic holdings to Mexico. In Asia they picked up untold riches, like Malaysian spices or goods from China. These were delivered to Acapulco on the west coast of Mexico. From here they were shipped overland to Caribbean ports, where the treasure fleet annually delivered them to Europe. Their best defense was the sheer size of the Pacific Ocean. Manila galleons were sometimes completely unarmed, because it was easy to miss a single ship in that vast expanse. Many sea rovers tried in vain to catch the Manila galleon. The privateer Shellwalk missed it narrowly in Mexico. In 1687, Captain Reed tried and failed to catch it in the Philippines. Woods Rogers managed to capture two smaller Manila galleons by cruising along the shore of Northern California. So did pirates use galleons? 
By the 1650s, the classical galleon of the Renaissance had gone extinct, and the word was used only reference to Spanish treasure ships that did have high sterns, but were otherwise just big and heavily armed cargo freighters. Pirates could neither capture these nor crew them effectively. Instead, the Spanish of the Caribbean used balandras, piraguas and barks. Their most iconic cargo ship was the Dutch-built Flute or Urca, what should be recognized as their stereotypical ship of the age, not the galleon. Let's take a look at a comment from last week. Danny Anderson asks how many of the Caribbean islands were inhabited by natives by the time the buccaneers arrived. As far as I know, the Caribbean islands were depopulated rather quickly by the Spanish. Islands are of course limited in space, and on islands like Hispaniola the Spanish killed off game to starve the natives and released dogs to hunt them. Mainland natives were able to resist the invaders more easily thanks to their harder terrain. Most of those tribes, like the Kuna and Darien, and the more known ones like the Mayans, survived to this day. Pirates interacted with them heavily, and this is something I will definitely cover in the future. Huge thanks to my supporters over on Patreon. Cole Freer, Max Dweck, Red Radio 88 and Michael Jantz. If you want to support me monetarily, please check out my Patreon and PayPal in the description below. If you can't, you can still help me by liking the video and leaving a comment. This will help the algorithm spread my content to more people. Cheers.